Hi all, and welcome back to uh, the Floating with Travel podcast. I'm Lexi. And I'm Misty. And today we're talking about the experience of Misty traveling while black, female, and American. Enjoy. Obviously you've traveled a lot and lived in the Middle East. What do you think it's like being black in the Middle East? Um, I think specifically being black American is one of the things that you have to take away. So I think one of um, the benefits of traveling is it gives you a world view of perception, right? Mm. Because uh, America is a really large country. Mm. And to move around it, it's it takes as much as it does take, like I've cited before, for me to go from the Middle East to Europe. Mm. Um, but here, like at home, we're just so... We're so caught up in like being black and being um, fighting for equality and fighting for um, just integrity to not be abused, to not be put down for our value, for our historical uh, contributions and stuff. So I think sometimes when we're here, we don't feel as equal. So like we feel like we're in the country, but we always are discriminated against in some role. Mm. But the moment that you leave out of this country, you really do understand the privilege that you have as an American because that will supersede everything else that you've been feeling. Mm -hmm. So like one of the situations that happened to me was during the Sandra Bland situation that was happening in the States. And I was affected, but I was not as impacted as I would have been as a black woman in America, but I was overseas. So I didn't really feel it. Really? We, I, I mean, well, I saw the news mm -hmm. and I saw everything going on, but I was just like, Hmm, that, shit like if that was me I would have did the same thing I would have had the same issues I would have been going as hard as she went mm -hmm. but I mean like the it didn't affect me because like when we get pulled over in Kuwait or you see fly, okay so when the police they just naturally drive with their lights on mm -hmm. and um, you get used to just seeing the flashes it doesn't mean you're getting pulled over it doesn't mean anything it just oh. means that today they didn't decide to turn the lights off just at all no yeah they just ride around they'll sit in traffic imagine sitting in traffic stop and go traffic for like 40 minutes and the police behind you and they don't turn their lights off. Like with sirens going? No. Just, oh, lights, just lights. Just flashing. <laughs> but I mean here, if the lights flash behind you, you, you get nervous, right? You mm -hmm. clench a bit. You're like, what did I do wrong? Was I going the right speed limit? What could I have had? You know, like, did, they, did I do something? And you get very nervous when you're approached by the police here because they don't police by... I mean, they're not like walking the beat anymore and getting to know you as a neighbor. They're kind yeah. of policing by terror, I think. On some instances, in some places, not all of everybody, you can't lump all together, but as black people, we're so caught up in that daily fight and that mm -hmm. struggle and saying, hey, our our ancestors built this country. We were brought over here um, involuntarily and we didn't want to be here and we built this country and I want you to recognize my value. But when I went overseas, I realized that although they do see me as black first, when they hear I'm American, they hear my accent or they ask where I'm from, everything changes because they're either going to hate America as a whole or they're going to love America. So it's like, they're not. So I've probably experienced more of the latter where people are pretty friendly toward Americans. Right. Have you actually experienced someone who like just outwardly does not like Americans? Mm, yeah. So I think like in the Middle East, you have a weird like tap dance with it. Fair right? point. Yeah, you have like, I mean, if you meet a Syrian family who's mm. had to flee, they might feel a particular way because it's a proxy war over there. And I'm not going to launch into that because it's political, but sometimes I just think that as black people, we need to get our passports. We need to travel outside of this country, yes. past Mexico and the Caribbean to really experience the privilege that we are um, given and have what our ancestors contributed and were what we built, we have that privilege outside of our country because for the most part, black Americans have built the hip hop culture, right? Mm -hmm. And the hip hop culture has is pervasive worldwide. That's like super true. everything people are loving right now is us. We are the social norms. We are the ling the like the language. We are the, the clothing. We are the, the fashion. Like, we are everything. So when you go away, you really are, like, received well in that sense. They're just like, ah, oh, you're Americans. Except for Brits that hate us. I mean, they're just miserable people, though, because it's cold there all the time. I don't know. I've had British friends, and I 
feel like they didn't have... So when we talked about different places, you realize that every place has their um, good perceptions and their bad perceptions. And mm -hmm. you can joke about that with everyone, mm -hmm. but you could say that about the British too. And I feel like they could say that about Americans, but there's also good stuff about both. No, that I, I didn't say that there was negative. No, I just think that, well, maybe, maybe I've had a different experience. Have you met my friend, Lukey? I have. She bashes Americans on a very regular basis. In fact, if I was to call her right now, she would go in on America. Which, I don't, I don't know if she knows that they lost the Civil War, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's for you, boo. Revolutionary War. You know what, though? <laughs> we, we sure did have help, though. They still lost, nonetheless. Yes. I don't care if we had help or not. Did you lose? You lost. It's win or lose. You're the first or you're last. So you. Bobby. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just, I feel like we've had different experiences in a lot of places that we've gone. Now, I do agree with your point. Black people do need to travel more because if more black people were traveling to remote places, you'd have less people staring at you like you're an animal in a zoo. Like, I yeah. know I've had those experiences. Do you get a lot of those? Okay, so I probably am stared at, but I might be oblivious to that because that's one of those things like you have to be really up in my face. But I also speak to everybody and I make them speak to me. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm a representative for our culture and I'm going to go out there and talk to everybody. I'm campaigning. I'm on vacation. I'm campaigning. I'm the president of America. <laughs> I don't know. In their eyes. It. At that moment. Okay. Real talk. Mm -hmm. You Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> as a general principle I don't feel like I have to be a representative for anyone but myself hip hop culture is pervasive but sometimes I feel like people love the culture but they don't necessarily like how it links to black people no I think what I think is that you encounter like they love the culture mm -hmm. they have the references and then they like want you to buy into that reference as mm -hmm. if like, you're a walking stereotype. And so when you don't yeah. fit into that, they're just like, what the fuck? Right. And so maybe that's my thing is that because I don't necessarily fit into that, they're like, well, okay, we're, we're about to go about our lives. I mean, just imagine some people's careers are still boosted by their touring in certain regions that have got to be 20 years behind the hip hop culture. That is that's so crazy massive. with YouTube. Mm -hmm. but the relevancy of the internet today, I'm not understanding how that you, how you still are able to do well. Well, I think that is one of the benefits of YouTube is that it really, it allows you to go across like time and pull things out because Japan, like I had some friends who went to go see D'Angelo in concert. This is a few years ago. That shit, uh, was he good? I didn't go see him. I mean, what did they say he was good? Oh, I don't even remember asking about it. I just knew ahead of time. <laughs> I was just, I was taken aback by it, and then I probably let it out of my mind. But I thought that's such a unique thing. Who's going to, like, who in Japan is thinking, oh, remember that one video? I want to go see that. Mm. Like, it's. But, I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's just the, the controlling of media, which is another thing about being American. Like, I think we have to recognize is that when we're in these and we're faced with um, what we might pr like consider oppression, mm -hmm. most of the time our freedom of speech is so you have to really venture out of the country to recognize what you're offered here mm -hmm. because America is yeah. the land of the free. You have so many privileges here. I know that it might seem like you're locked into some bullshit <laughs> because you see, you hear what the media is like pushing down your throats, but go to another country Go to another country where they're struggling for running clean water mm -hmm. and food. And beyond that, go to a metropolitan that will cater to the tourists, but the locals are like South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. You can go to Cape Town. What was it? Last year? Mm -hmm. They didn't have running water. Like they were on water shortages and cycles. Oh. So in the hotels, they were providing water. Mm -hmm. But even then they were telling you to like, be careful of your water consumption. But there were people in that same city that didn't have water. I mean, is that not California? <laughs> no, they are not, you not, know, not quite running to that out extent. of water in California. They might be doing rolling blackouts right now because of forest fires, but like, it's yeah, not the same thing. You have power out for like hours and or, I've heard, 
for someone like 12 hours, no power. Where? In, like Northern California, I want to say. In the forest? I don't think they were a woodland creature. They were creature. the that didn't get the generators? No, I mean, who needs, like, as a city dweller, I'm not running out to get a generator. But, but you're a city dweller, and where would you put one even if you ran out to get one? You plug into the wall that didn't have electricity? That's a good point. I have no idea. <laughs> right. If I bought a generator, I wouldn't know what the hell to do with it. I mean, it's like Diambe. So Diambe lives in the Bahamas, mm-hmm. and they had rolling blackouts. Remember? We were there in the restaurant, and the power went out like three times. I was sitting in the house when the power went out. We were locked in because we couldn't get the gate open. <laughs> and you had to wait for it to come back on. Mm-hmm. Like, those are real world problems. But, like, I think you just have to really leave the states to recognize that your being black is there, but being American supersedes your being your blackness, right? Mm-hmm. And most of the time, you're revered for being black. I don't know if I'd say revered in my experience. I, I haven't had any bad experiences. I, I don't know. There's something about it that just feels like a, a non-thing. Obviously, people look at you making immediate assumptions but for some reason, they seem to go by the wayside. Or maybe it's just, like, my own opinion of it. Because, so you feel like you've had better experiences because you're black. With the people that revere black Americans because of hip-hop or whatever, yes. Or those that really, really enjoyed President Obama. hmm Which, you know, it brings up a different thing. I do think that people that don't necessarily like Americans do tend to like black people who are American. Right. So that is one benefit is that, (laughs) I mean, it's amazing how you go to another country and someone else can acknowledge how shittily you're treated at home. Maybe it's like they're like, we understand oppression, bro. Mm -hmm. How is the people? Right. That could be it. I'm not sure. I just know that in Kuwait, right, once they figure out that I am American, Mm -hmm. I am treat it differently Mm -hmm. and it's been what 30 years that was in the 90s yeah so about 30 ish years since the Gulf War Mm -hmm. and um the older generation is very like appreciative because we came in and, and whatever but the new generation like my generation they are I want to say they don't actually recognize it because they I would probably raised without knowing what it was not that I need them to know but they treat you differently because mm-hmm. they just recognize that, yeah, you're discriminated against, but you're the culture. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're popular, right? So um, I have a different experience. Once they realize that I'm not a laborer and I'm not like somebody that they can take advantage of, I'm actually Western, I am treated differently. They change how they react towards me. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the States, I think sometimes we encounter a bit of discrimination, but I don't know. We were We were raised in a very like, either white neighborhood or multicultural area. Mm. So. <laughs> that is a gentle way to say that. Well, I don't know. Like, No, it was multicultural. It just, the question mark that was like subtext of that statement was funny. Yeah. No, it was multicultural though. We were raised in predominantly white areas and obviously shaped us to be a little different but I don't think I had any truly negative experiences because of that well a few like awkward experiences but I don't yeah. I think because of that when I go to other places you just let it go because you realize oh people I mean they don't know what they don't know and everyone's ignorance can't be my project to fix True. No, that's a really, actually, that's a really real statement. I just think that, like, sometimes we have to, we we do need more. We need to travel more. We just need to, to recognize you got to get outside of America. And mm. then you got to go for more than, and I'm not dogging people who do this. I'm not saying anything negative, but I just don't believe that you should leave your country to go to another country to stay in your hotel room. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not that scary. If you could make oh, yeah. a 12 to 15 hour flight, you can fucking man up enough to go outside and integrate with the people and recognize the culture. There's still like, you can stay in the tourism side of it, but you don't, you shouldn't be afraid. If you were afraid, mm-hmm. you shouldn't have left. Yeah. Well, there's no way I'm taking a flight that long to not go see stuff. But I know people that don't, they won't go anywhere. And then I know other people who strictly go just to get cool pictures and they never, ever really 
like feel what it's like to be in that country or understand those cultures. And I think it's very important as black people, especially as black Americans, mm-hmm. that we do see that because we don't have ties to a really long lineage. Mm-hmm. We've been here, what, 412 years, something of mm-hmm. that nature. Like our lineage is short and it ends and it begins at slavery. Mm-hmm. Like most people can't document themselves past that. Yeah. So to see how other people have their cultural ties and to see how like those social norms set in, when you come back home, it helps you understand what you have, what your social norms are, the power that you have, the voice that you have, and how you can go about attacking different um, issues Mm -hmm. and how blessed you are to be here. Because a lot of people will come over here and they will like, they will make the the most of the opportunity. And we're still sitting here like you owe me from 400 years. Not that I don't think they don't owe us um, because that's a whole nother conversation. I'm not jumping into reparations, but I'm just saying that we have to understand what we have as an American citizen and what we're able to accomplish with the different programs that are at our fingertips. Yeah. Well, in some ways, I think there is a cultural difference. Like, there's a huge difference between, like, say, being black American and someone who's actually from Africa. Because you do have, I don't know, really different sense of who you are and how you are and the communal aspect that's raising you up. Because most other cultures, and I mean, almost every other culture has a community aspect Mm -hmm. that they survive because everyone survives Mm -hmm. and they thrive because they build everyone up. And I don't think that exists in black America, but I feel like it does exist in Africa in general. No, I agree. But that's because they can trace back like two, 3000 years. Most of the time they can, they can recognize that. But that is what I'm saying. Like our identity is and should always be derived from how strong we are and what we've been able to overcome. Mm -hmm. And as I've traveled to like the different places, I really enjoy like talking to people that are from these countries because I like to hear historical references that they cite Mm -hmm. in addition to Googling and reading up on their cultures and like one of the things I got when I was in Bali, right? I did Ubud mm-hmm. in Bali and I really enjoyed Ubud because it was such a spiritually calm place. Mm-hmm. They prayed five times a day. They cleansed their air, you know, kind of like how we yeah. smudge and they really connected with the environment. And you mm-hmm. could tell that the energy they were giving out was reciprocated back because it was such a really gentle, calm spirit. Mm-hmm. Everybody there was very chill and welcoming and you just felt, um, I felt because I know you had a really different experience, but I mean, it was, I was only there for like six hours and did yoga. It was nice. Oh, okay. I felt just really, really calm. And one of the things when I was in Kenya, um, I, cause I went to Mombasa and I'm going to go to Western Africa, but on Eastern, the Eastern country that I went to, it was just that even though they were like poor countries, mm-hmm. they were resourceful yeah. and they had the community and you just look at these and you're like, okay, what can I take back home? Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, you you automatically are considered American when you're there. Like, they see color, but they see the status. They see what your, yeah. your passport holds. And, that, like, for me, that's what started making me realize the power that I actually hold. Mm-hmm. Because I can go, we're 125 countries. Mm-hmm. We can travel without visa requirements. It wasn't until I was trying to go, because I want to go to Ghana, right? Mm-hmm. They're like, you have to get a visa. And I'm like, what? I have to get a visa? Wait, like, have you not had to get visas before? Like, to go where? China, Cambodia, Vietnam, Japan. Actually, not Japan for visiting. But, yeah, I've had to get visas. You have to get a visa to go to China? Yeah, they make you, like, send in your passport and everything. Really? Mm-hmm. So, there, I've never been there, so I didn't know that. But I've never been anywhere where I had to get, like, a visa before I go. Oh. A visa upon arrival. I just walk into the country. So, when I'm doing Ghana, and my friends are just like, you're so privileged. Like, I was sitting here like, what do you mean I need to send you my bank statements? They're like, what do you mean? What's wrong with that? We're happy that countries are actually enforcing it. So I'm just like, what do you need my goddamn bank statements for? That I'm does coming seem for eight extra. Days. Well, Ghana wants your bank statements. They want your hotel. They want your flight. They want, um, you have to get a yellow fever vaccination. And um, you have to do an application. I think there's something else I'm forgetting. 
And yeah. you're still going. Wait, and then you can't do it. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do it before sixty days out. Mm-hmm. You still have to mail your passport to the consulate. I'm mm-hmm. like, I thought you guys wanted us to move here. Like, I thought you were like taking all Americans in, and we're <laughs> we're family, and let's really like buy up, and we can vote. Why are you making me knowing all this? <laughs> Why is they want to make sure they're taking in the right people, <laughs> right? They don't want the dirty backpackers. <laughs> I understand. You know what? That's a really good thing. Keep that up. Right, that does keep a whole different uh, thing. Now, I did want to go to Brazil, and I that put me off thinking of having to do a visa for them. Right, they did stop that, though. What was it, like two months ago? Really? Yeah, so you no longer have to, um, <laughs> which is why I know somebody that's gone there a couple, five times now. You in no the longer, last two months? You no longer have to mail in your visa. Okay. But probably because financially they can't afford to like stop us from coming because that's a yeah. deterrence for people. It really is. I wouldn't go somewhere like that required. Well, obviously I would go somewhere that requires visa. So you were in Japan and you mailed off your passport or you just took it to the um, I just gave it to the travel agent who was planning my stuff. I don't know. It was a different life there. Every, you know what? Imagine how you are like in Kuwait where you're like, it's just so safe. You could leave money just sitting on, like, a bench and no one's going to take it. Mm-hmm. That's how Japan was. You just don't expect that crime is going to happen. So I'm like, yeah, take my passport. I'm good. So how long did they keep it for? Like a week. Oh, no. I get angst when it's time for me to be without my passport. You know what? I would probably feel really nervous about it now. But at the time, it seemed like nothing to just, like, hand it over and be like, whatever. It's just my freedom out of this place. I mean, I was under contract anyway. <laughs> well, that makes sense. But yeah, so that's what I think that is. And in Kuwait, it really showed me because when you you travel, they're like, "Oh, where are you from?" And you say you're American, right? So one of the sto- uh, one of the things that happened when I first got to Kuwait, I think I had like a lot of things happen to me in the first five months that were really really. Like, I made great friends, but mm-hmm. then I encountered a bunch of different things, and maybe the things I encountered I wouldn't have if I didn't have like a a, like a support system that I felt mm. comfortable with but like um I was at a barbecue and there was a bunch of people standing around and the, they were just talking about where they were from and what they do and then the guy turns to me he's a Lebanese guy he turns to me he was like oh where are you from mm-hmm. and I'm like oh um I'm from the states I'm like what I, I don't know if I said I'm American or I'm from Vegas I might have said oh I'm from Vegas he was like no but like where are you from And I was like, Vegas? America? Because maybe he doesn't know where Vegas is. I'm Mm -hmm. like, America. He's like, no, 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 no. Like, where's your mom from? I'm like, she's from Pennsylvania, but she was raised in Harlem, too. He's like, well, where's your dad from? I'm like, well, his family is from Chicago, but some of them are in Mississippi. He's like, no, 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 no. Like, But where are you from from? Like, where are your great-grandparents from? And I'm not understanding where this question is going. I don't understand it. I'm just like, what are you talking about? So I'm thinking like, I've just told you like where my parents are from, Mm -hmm. Chicago, Mississippi. And then he's just like, no, like where are your great, great grandparents from? (laughs) And that's when it hit me. I'm just like, what? (laughs) And I think my face contorted because my confusion started to clarify. Mm -hmm. And this girl was standing next to him. And I was just like, what do you mean where am I from from? He's just like, I'm just trying to understand where you're from ancestral. And I'm just like, I was like, have you heard of the transatlantic slave trade? My grandparents, my great, great, great grandparents were kidnapped, put on a boat and brought (laughs) over. They're cotton picking niggas. Like that's what they did. And then they got free from slavery. And then we built, that's where we're from. So you get into the weirdest conversations with people. Like, I've been in a taxi with you and someone starts these conversations and you get into, like, history of America. (laughs) And I'm wondering, like, what is she doing? Oh, when we were in Amsterdam and the guy was from Suriname. Yeah. And he's, but his roots were from Ghana. Yes. You see where he knew who he's from from? No, no, I get that. But, like, how did you even get into that conversation? He said he was from Suriname. That, I mean, he led into it. It was a gateway conversation. It's like gateway drugs. Don't smoke the marijuana if you don't want to do the coke. I don't think that's even a thing. I think scientifically that's been proven <laughs> to be false. But science aside, Who I think my that? thing... State scientific facts that says that's not... I'm sorry, I didn't bring my uh, references. You bring that next time. Next time. So then I'm correct. I brought mine. 
You definitely didn't name a scientific reference. I just said, when you say where you're from, you normally talk where you're from. Yeah. So when people ask me where I'm from, I just say Vegas. And if they don't sound like they know where Vegas is, then that's the end of the conversation. Well, you're American. Mm -hmm. It's a shallow perception. My best friend is Jamaican. So if they say, oh, where are you living or where are you from? He might say America. And then they might say, where are you from from? And he'll say, oh, Jamaica. And they'll be like, oh, Jamaica. And then they'll go into that. But because we can't reference outside of America, they want to keep digging because they don't understand how we don't know. So I think what's funny is that when most people ask me, where are you from? And I say Las Vegas, I already get the, oh, Las Vegas, that must be so fun. And I get like random questions like, oh, do you live in hotels? And I mean, I I hate that question. I know, it's such a dumb question. But I get that, but I don't get... No, but like outside of Vegas, where are you from from? No one has ever asked me that except when I'm with you. Unless they have and I didn't understand. So I just said, well, like Las Vegas near Los Angeles. And then they stopped talking to me. <laughs> Erin, I'm not asking her no more yet. No questions. <laughs> no, but these are, I mean, these are questions and conversations I have abroad. And Kuwait, these are normal questions mm-hmm. in Kuwait. Because then the girl who came to my rescue, was she was from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. She was like, no, you don't understand. She's trying to get him to understand that. I'm American and we don't always know where we're from. And he's just like, but I don't understand. And I'm just like, I'm done talking to you. Where was she from? She was um, British Nigerian. Okay. And then where was she from? Lebanon. Okay. That is a weird instance of someone asking you that many times. I suppose I've just never experienced it. So I would have been real confused. You might have been drinking. You know, drinking really pushes you to get like to where you're like really your true self. That's true. I suppose I might have just been like, I don't get why you're asking. What are, like, what are your intentions? What are you going to do with this information? (laughs) Why are you interrogating me? (laughs) But aren't you curious? Like, seriously, what are you going to do with this information? Say I just came up with any country, pulled a name out of a hat, and told you. What happens? You done with the hat? Yeah, I'm done with the hat. Okay. You had some fun? Good times, good times. (laughs) Leave the hat alone. I mean, I don't know why you're judging it. It's my hat. It looked good on me. I look good. Ooh. I look fly. You know what? Uh, you just have a way. Mm-hmm. Maybe this is why you get into those weird conversations. Because you're snooty and people want to bring you down a peg and <laughs> remind you you don't know where you're from. Yeah, joke was on him. <laughs> was it? <laughs> he felt confused and I left vindicated. <laughs> And angry. (laughs) Well, why were you angry, though? Because I thought he was coming for me. I didn't understand it was a normal question. And so now I get it all the time because, like, when my other friend, she gets her questions. And she's just like, well, she does the you thing, actually. Mm -hmm. She's like, why do you need to know? I just told you. Do you not hear my accent? It's British. They're like, yeah, but where are you from? She's like, why? Tell me why, and I will give you an answer. But for what? Have you never asked these people why? Because that's a weird question. It's well, an invasive question. Well, they're nosy. Uh, I don't, man, nosy people. I can't deal with nosy people. I'm like, you know I'm what? telling you, people, they just want to see where you fit in their mind of their hierarchy so they can feel like how they're going to come at you. Either way, I'm just going to still tear you down because that's just my nature. I want you to feel comfortable but uncomfortable. I want you to feel loved but on guard. It's an oxymoron. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. Okay. I'm a gentle teddy bear with teeth. So, when you're traveling, do you feel like being female and being black puts you at a better advantage or disadvantage or doesn't play a part? Well, that is a good question, Lexi. I like that you came to this point because I really wanted to touch on that. I feel oh your feelings. <laughs> yes, let me share yeah. with you my feelings because I have so many of them. Um, disadvantage or advantage? I think your American privilege has an advantage. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that you being black most times will help once they realize you're American. Mm-hmm. But if they don't realize you're American, then it can be a negative. Okay. Like, I was in Denmark, and I'm not sure if they realized that I was black, but because I was American, they, like, it almost blinded them. So then they were talking about how, like, the men that migrated to the country 
from African countries were aggressive and rapist. And I'm just like, hmm, do you feel that way because you're a white woman and they're a black man or are they really that way? Because mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm supposed to be on guard or just feel like you're discriminating. So, so sometimes I, I think that you encounter that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't yeah. know. I was like, so what do you mean by this? She's like, we carry yeah. whistles. Bitch, what is a whistle going to do? Alert other people. And then, you know, she told me this in a taxi while our driver, oh, no. I don't even know where the driver was from, but he was black. And I was just like. That's such an awkward place to be. So in that situation, like what wins out, being female or being black? What do you Shit, say Shit, I'm that? shrinking into the seat cushions because I feel like at the end of the day, I am black and I understand the struggle. Mm-hmm. Like your comfort with me just, that's the weird part. If yeah. you're well-spoken, they forget that you're something. Mm-hmm. So like when Black Lives Matter was happening, I was at work and my boss was like talking about how he thinks that that platform didn't mm-hmm. hold any validity. And I was just like, I'm sitting here looking around like, like we do not agree on this. Did right. I change, did I change colors? Yeah. I had to remind him. I was like, um, sir, listen, I, I don't know if you've forgotten, but I'm black. Like <laughs> you just literally offended me. That platform has a purpose. Mm-hmm. There is a meaning behind it. The movement may be misdirected in some instances, but it is, organized for a reason so i'd appreciate if you respect it he's like well no you don't really count how the fuck do i not count Ooh, i hate when people say stuff like that it's so uncomfortable so like obviously i listen to rap music but i will not listen to rap music around people that do not look like me because i never want someone to get comfortable enough to think that they can say the n-word around me because we've we've heard it together Right, like you understand what I'm saying. It's just a song. Yeah, it's like, oh, no. So I was like, I will listen to anything. I will suffer <laughs> through some country, but we will not be listening to this song together. I was jamming, but I'd have to jam with headphones or nothing. Right, I'm just saying. So I think sometimes internationally that's what happens. They'll get comfortable enough to mm-hmm. make these comments because they see it. They see past it. They just see a well-spoken American, and they don't correlate color all the time. I'm not sure, like, why it's that way. Maybe it's the accents that are lost or just ignorance. But, like, I feel that when I travel most times as a female, I think you said it, as a female, your safety is probably in danger more so than being black unless you're in, like, Nazi Germany, which I really don't even actually feel exists anymore because they are such an inclusive country. Like, they are Mm. trying to really push past that period in life. Not that they are not guilty of it. But I just, my emphasis is more on saying, leave the country, understand your privilege. So when Mm -hmm. you come back to the country, you understand what you have here and understand, have a greater knowledge to build within your own community. Mm -hmm. Because then you understand that like, okay, so it does take a village to raise a child. I am breaking down because I'm trying to do everything on my own. And I do need more than just myself so I do need to build my network mm-hmm. in that sense. Well, traveling elsewhere is so important. And I think this for everyone, because no matter where you go, you're either going to find things that make you appreciate your home or things that make you think we could do better. Mm-hmm. So every everywhere I've gone, I've had one of those two feelings and both of them are really helpful. I think it probably is helpful for black people to travel to see what they could do better for communities Mm -hmm. because we can definitely do more for that so when it comes to traveling like what's your emphasis on picking like black dominated spaces more so now that's kind of where I'd like to go there are some times when I want to just travel Mm -hmm. but I think sometimes you get out there and you want to kind of be around more of your people but you know I, I really hate to say that sometimes I do think of like locations with danger factors and I'm just like okay so will I get robbed Mm -hmm. but am I affected by colorism in that sense? Like the darker the country, am I more scared? Because I have had friends that have Mm -hmm. gone to predominantly like, excuse me, African countries and move around by themselves, single females that are not black and they're just, they're completely safe. 
as long as you're smart, you can go almost anywhere. But the, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I've, I found a struggle with deciding where I want to go. Mm -hmm. Because I find that there's no place that I necessarily feel very comfortable. So, say you go to a black space, you still feel like an other because you're not, like, we're not African, no, this is true. You want you can the fastest way to not feel like you're one of them is to be around a couple of them at the same time. Because you realize how different your life experience is. But then going to other places, like I think it's crazy that I've been to thirty countries but I've never been to Africa. Like that's oh. almost kind of disappointing. Yeah. And I went to Morocco, which I feel like doesn't count, but they say it counts. Um mm, barely. Kenya I feel like it's a black There you go, that counts. country. I'm really excited about going to Ghana. I want to do Senegal, um, Nigeria. But then I'm just like, okay, so you could do a bunch, but the thing is you have to keep applying for visas every time you transfer. And they don't have one visa that goes through the Western, what is it called? The Western African, I, I forget what it's called. But they have like a little. I was going to say peninsula, but I feel like that's wrong. Nah. Nevertheless, I... I do think I'm going to make more of a point to start visiting African countries, but I don't think it'll feel like going home. Well, I was in Chicago around a bunch of people that looked like me, and I still felt outside. This is true. And so I think that's like, you don't have to, like, I'm not ever in search. When I travel, when I choose my countries to go to, I kind of choose, like, based off of, like, Weather, time of year, things I want to see, mm -hmm. right? And at this point, um, I feel like the world is so much smaller. So I've not been to Egypt and I want to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to do like Turkey, but obviously that's not a black country. And I want to do Ghana, which I will do. And Cape Town, which is a, a very weird history. Mm -hmm. And mosh, like mix of people. Mm -hmm. Like their cultures are, it's just a different group. So... I don't, I don't want to pick based off of where I feel like I'm going home. I'm not on that journey. That's not yeah. my journey. No, but... Some people's journey is that, though. Yeah, like true. When they're traveling, they're like, where do I feel like I fit in? That's not my journey. I fit in in America, in the cities I like to go to, mm -hmm. and I really like Dubai because it's like a... I think it's a hosh posh of new culture, old culture, and um, new building. Mm -hmm. And really, I just like that they're really leaning forward to moving forward to be like a world dominating country mm -hmm. in such a small space, technology, technologically advanced, those types of things. But I, I just generally kind of travel to like where I think would be nice to, to see. No, I get you. So like Noelle got her, um, she did her DNA test and her goal is to go to every single country that her lineage is from. I was How like, many was that? I don't remember. I was like, damn. <laughs> Um, well, maybe, like, the primary ones, so, like, the top five that, Damn. that are the, like, the most. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting goal, because, one, you get an opportunity to know where you're from, B, you get to kind of see where you're from. However, um, oh, which one? Oh, there's not, like, 23 and Me, but there's another one that's really focused on black people, and try, kind of... Um, figuring out like your the tribes that you're from really? yeah I wonder how they do that right that seems labor intensive just by virtue of getting all of the different DNA but how do they I'm gonna look into that Diambe did ancestry dna.com mm -hmm. and then what did it say we we're from Ghana <laughs> man I don't remember hearing about this she sent it to us it was like 70 percent Ghana and then 30 percent was like Scandinavian countries that seems weird I mean, not 30%. I could... <laughs> you don't want to be a Viking? I mean, I realize I'm wearing Rihanna's 350, so obviously I'm a little bit lighter, but <laughs> I'm not quite... I just don't feel like 30% of me is Scandinavian. It's a large percentage. Right? But that was what it said. It said it was like Ghanaian and um, Scandinavian, and I don't... I have to actually find the message, because I think she did it a couple years ago, but... Well, I don't think our lineage should have changed within the last few years. You know what we should do to see how accurate it is? If we each did it, <laughs> we could see, see if everyone gets the same thing. Right. You're like, now we're going to go with different companies too. Right. See which company is actually reputable. If they all say the same thing. Oh, well, then we know we're 30%.
Questionable, though. Yeah. Send us your DNA kit so we can try this out. You know what? What's off-putting about those is the idea of, like, spitting a bunch in the cup because you have to, like, reach a line. I mm. think I would actually just start, like, salivating by wanting to throw up just thinking about, like, looking at my... It's fine. It's... <laughs> <laughs> That went too far. <laughs> no, I'm literally just thinking about it. I'm grossing my own mouth out. It just I just got dry mouth because it's just like, no. I will not give you my saliva. <laughs> right? Imagine if they're just world dominating and collecting our DNA. I mean, in some fashion, like, don't you, you think? Can you put five hairs, strands of hair in this bag? I need a tooth sample. <laughs> well, have you heard of, like, um, someone got arrested over that because they were doing their... Their ancestry, or 23andMe, one of those. And once they sent in their DNA, it connected with a crime. <laughs> <laughs> but how did them doing their DNA connect with a crime? Like, what database are they running this Exactly. Through? That's oh, what you hell. have to start asking. I mean, I'm not a criminal, so I can send no, in my DNA. Right. I don't think I have any problems with it. But I don't think it was the person who sent it in. I think it was, the, like, the person's either family, someone in their family. It just linked it back to them. I was like, there was a serial killer we were missing, huh? I mean, it can't you imagine. Bad. You're like, God damn it, she wanted to know where you were from. I've been hiding 10 years. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> you couldn't have waited for me I to die. I would have been pissed. <laughs> right? I would have been so livid. I'm about to actually put a hit out on you from jail. Or we both could. Or I'm going to tell them that you were my accomplice. I didn't understand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So, yes. <laughs> so help you God. Yes, I did. I told you that part. Let me tell you. He helped me. He had the foot. They're yeah. like, but we didn't ask the questions. That's all that matters. He helped me. He had the foot. That's all I got to say. Take me to jail. There's no loyalty. <laughs> None. After you did an ancestry test and now I'm going to jail. <laughs> Can you imagine if you actually were that person? It would be interesting. I'd be pissed. No, so I guess I don't know. Like, I think that we all travel for different reasons. That's the mm -hmm. other thing, you know? So, um, travel culture right now is to just look like you've been different places. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how we can move past, like, Instagram-worthy pictures because they are phenomenal pictures that do inspire you to want to go to different places. I know we kind of talked about going into black spaces. Now, say you're not necessarily going to, like, Africa, but would you get in on, like, some of the the black travel movement um, tours that they're doing or, like, Black Yacht Week or anything? No. I... <laughs> I don't actually um, like group tours like that because oh, okay. of how um, planned out they are, okay? Yeah. Like, when you show yeah. up to them, I did a Destination Dubai thing, mm -hmm. like, a couple weeks ago or three, five weeks ago, and it is literally, like, I think it's, like, spring break travel. Oh, yeah. So, but for grown folk. And my thing about travel for me is that I want to connect to the cultures. Mm -hmm. So, when Black Travel Movement does their trips, they, I think they did a Yacht Week mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, and I think... Up in the air did uh, up. I don't know what it's called, Util mm -hmm. or something like that. They do one. They get a couple boats out in Croatia during their yacht week, which mm -hmm. is all summer. And then there's a another yacht week that's off of Tanzania that they plan. That sounds so fun though. Right, but like you know the level of planning that has to go into these mm -hmm. events for them to arrange transportation, arrange boats, arrange. Um, all of these things, like people show up wanting you to provide a, a, a service. They don't want yeah. to have done anything. They just want to sign up, pay for the package, and then sh and then go. And that's considered the, their vacation, their holiday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, like what happened? Like the Black Travel Movement did theirs in the Caribbean. Where did they yeah. port out of? Barbados or something? I actually don't recall. But I don't think yeah. it was, I think it was like almost like a fire fest. Like, I just feel like he had so much pressure on him to mm -hmm. do such a big scale event mm -hmm. that sometimes the logistics behind that fail. And and you don't get the quality mm -hmm. um, of service that you are, are used to. So, for instance, yeah. I have a really big level of what I want to receive. Mm -hmm. When you do this, sometimes those don't come out to your dream because everybody's coming for the same thing for the same events that are scheduled. Like, you have a whole calendar that mm -hmm. they, the itinerary they put out. 
I mean, that's challenging, though. Because, like, you think about Croatia's Yacht Week. It didn't become that overnight. That's been building up for years. True. And then for, like, the Black Travel Movement Yacht Week, this is, I think this is, like, their second year doing it. And you're trying to, I think they were trying to build it to be the same as, like, Croatia's. And I was like, that took time. Mm -hmm. That took connections and resources. You have to allow yourself to grow. And I don't think some small businesses get that opportunity. It's like, no, you have to give us that experience now, and then you have to give it to us for less money. Exactly. So they're always trying to buy in so that you can afford it. Do you know how much a yacht costs? Nonetheless, a yacht with a driver, a skipper, you have to provide food for a whole week, for seven days, and then on top of that, you have to schedule and plan events. Yeah, that's, to me, that's like a... 10,000 plus vacation for something like that. And if you're wanting it for half of that, you're going to get a not great experience. Granted, I don't know how much they were charging for that. But to me, it's just you go all out or you don't do anything at all. However, for me, I would also like those families that spend up all year to go to Disney World as their one vacation. Mm -hmm. I was like, you could have taken like three smaller road trips and had some had good memories on all of them rather than one time going someplace. So for people that are just going to use all of their resources, go to a yacht week, and then that's it, like that's disappointing for a year. I mean, but if you think about it, the way Croatia runs, because it does actually run from like May to September, mm -hmm. it is yacht week every week. Mm -hmm. You rent your boat <laughs> a year in advance, then you figure out who you're going with, and mm -hmm. then you guys divvy it up. But it's not one particular country company that's oh. putting together a whole trip so if say ah. we wanted to go out of split or dubrovnik and we show up mm. we're going with our friends getting on a boat meeting other people oh. that happen to be there for that experience so it's like byob bring your own boat basically okay and then you you like you go and you port around other boats and, and then you just chill. oh exactly so but like when they're planning a whole thing it's it's yacht week, but it's it's more like holiday package week. Gotcha. So it's for me, I don't like thing. those kinds of things. If all of my friends wanted to go and we rent a boat and it's around the time when everybody's renting the boat, cool. I'm down for that. Because that's a real, not to knock it, but to me, that's a real travel experience. Mm -hmm. But to go when a everything has been planned out for you mm -hmm. and then get upset when it all goes wrong, you gave up all your control. Can we just say, I like the boldness that you'd be okay with renting a boat again after what has happened in the past. Well, I'm just doing, hypothetically speaking, I wouldn't even want to get a boat. I mean, I have really bad experiences with water. Uh, I'm not the strongest swimmer. However, once I start <laughs> drinking, I get my little courage. And little somehow, courage. A lot more courage. the tide and currents always picks up and I end up out yonder if you I mean, guys m imagine what yonder is over there it's kind of important to mention that we weren't even in the ocean we were in a lake <laughs> it was we really strong man-made lakes so it had little lake fish mead. that were jumping out of the water what were they carp they eat humans oh, I, they what? jump out the water and they do this thing and they flop back down and it's murky you can't see what's down there you don't understand my fears. when did carp become piranhas over there they in that ocean they were there's nothing to eat so as a semi like family friend trip, we rented a houseboat. So Things are track. going totally good. They tried to However, we started drinking immediately and who actually sat through the uh, safety briefing when they said, "Here's how to run the boat." It Sam. was Sam. I thought you did too. Man, we only had one per You know what? Now I see where <laughs> we went wrong. We only had one person sit through the safety briefing. So we I were off and away, taking off, just going out, and there's a slide at the top that stops like 10 feet above the water, like that could be safe, and a few people decide, yeah, let's hop off this slide, it's all gonna be fun, and you were, were you the first person? No. No. Who was first? Diambe. She's a fish. Wait, Diambe got into the water, got back out, <laughs> and then you... We were all in the water, and then somehow the current got me. It's like I, I had a long blink look like this. And when I opened my eyes, I was 1,200 feet away from everybody in the boat. And I was feet. trying to figure out 
what happened and why God this, did this to me. Well, I enjoy that Sam really tried to help you out and save your life. And to thank her, you tried to drown her. The current was strong. I was drowning. She came to save me. What do you do when somebody comes to save me? You save you. You grab onto them. No, but... I was dying. Like, at least from where we were looking, it didn't look like you were trying to, like, grab on her. It looked like you were using her as a buoy and just, like, pushing her down. I feet away from you. You couldn't really with... You don't have any ocular proof of this. Well, I do... Like, why don't you tell the story of how you lived? I think that's a really good ending to this. God saved me. (laughs) (laughs) Hallelujah! Wow. Man, you will never give me my due. I... I jumped thought, off the side of the boat oh my God. with a life vest on and a life vest for her because Sam decided she needed to get out of Dodge. <laughs> she didn't she leave me. Get she said, fuck you, bitch. <laughs> and swam away. So I swam against the current. I was praying for my life. And God <laughs> sent the first boat out to save me. The first boat. I came by, gave her a life vest, Tried to get her to put it on. She just held it. She wouldn't even put on the life vest. I, I was and, tired. I had yeah. asthma. I couldn't breathe. Carpal tunnel and asthma, miss? It was really rough. What's your life? I'm going through a lot of stuff. I have health issues. I'm a healthy yeah. individual that takes my vitamin C. But on that particular day, elements got the best of me. I, I, was, I was like this. <laughs> Jesus, please save me. Please. I mean... I don't think we should undercut how much Sam's life was in danger, first by you trying to drown her, and then by who started the boat and tried to run her over with the boat? <laughs> was that? That was Ruel. Because I do remember. No, she was almost there. I was like, oh, she's going to make it. She's going to make it. And the next thing you know, like the boat just goes, boom. No, but she hopped and right off like, the side. bouncing off the side. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was, it was such a mess. And finally, I think the boat came and picked us up. After that, no one else was getting in the water because there are the some worst person. In there. It was heaven. Was it? She was. She was so bad, and she was so high. I don't even understand that. Well, I mean, that will tell you. Go to the safety briefings when you're on cruises, and they say, "Hey, take a second. <laughs> Here's where the life vests are. You should definitely learn that." And if you're on a boat and you don't even have actual staff that can help you, you all should definitely learn it. Because it's a shame that only one person who happened to hop off and try and save your life was the only one who could drive that boat. I appreciate her. And God looked out for me and sent a savior. It's like that story about the man that was in the water and he was praying. He was like, Jesus, save me. Please save me. And then he sent the boat and he was like, no, God is going to save me. Right? Mm -hmm. Sam came and I thought she had me. But apparently, no, she was Satan, so she ran. She left me. And I was just <laughs> there, just like, fix it. And then I said, please, please, I swear, I will be a better person. Come save me because I don't deserve to die. I'm too young and I'm pretty. And, you know, I will drink more water. And <laughs> then. That's why he gave you all that water. You entire lake to drink. Oh, my God. I was de- I was drowning. And then I started really worried about those fish. I was really worried about those fish. You today. really just, were. I just started eyeballing. The fish touched me. <laughs> I was like, you don't just put on this life jacket so that we can both survive. Right. But I took the second boat that God sent because I recognized that, you know, I just needed to get out of this situation and really take a breather. Ooh, what a mess. And I so that's why I laugh when you're like, if my friends decide to get a yacht, we can all go to Yacht Week again. Like, you know you don't belong on the water. I've done boats, though. We do mm-hmm. rent boats. We rent boats. And so we tie the floaty to the boat, Mm -hmm. to the back of it, and then I get into the raft that's tied to the back of the boat. Barcelona, I tried to get you on a boat. You winched the entire time. It's cold. It was cold. The water's choppy. The water was choppy. It was just a lovely sunset cruise. Sunset, chilly. Wasn't I sick? I had pneumonia. (laughs) My gosh. (laughs) Because you're always sick. Why don't you just save your own life? (laughs) <laughs> you're always falling apart my nose is running we can't do this i was a trooper i was on antibiotics and sinus medicine and cold medicine just for your birthday you are just ungrateful i mean we were just out there enjoying this boat ride i think i'm getting sick i took dramamine on top of everything else <laughs> Were you not trying to come back from this boat ride? <laughs> I had wine 
crying afterwards. I was just ready to go to bed after that. <laughs> you sure did have a lot of... You were enjoying those beverages, too. Ooh, that was... Boats. You and boats don't go along together. Right. So, I mean, in my in the example of Yacht Week, it is a great experience um, if you want to do it. I think you should do Croatia. Mm-hmm. Get a boat with five or six people. Split the cost. Bring your fancy rafts. All your nice bathing suits. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just not something I would probably do for five days. But Yeah, that is a long time. That's a long time to be on a boat. And, like, even a yacht. Unless you're getting, like, a serious yacht, that's a long time to be on a single boat. Right. So, would you do any of the other, like, kind of group travel things that they put together? Or, no, you just need to be independent. Lone wolf in it. Lone wolf in it. I, it's just not for me. It's not my travel. It's not my travel space. It's not my travel type. It's not my travel desire. It's not my travel interest. It's not how I move around. I mean, I get you. I'm... I'm an independent traveler. I just want to set my own itinerary. And there's something great about, like, going when you want to go. Right. And you don't have to go to... If it's convenient, I'll show up, but I'm not going to go to all the events. Mm-hmm. Because I'm thinking, like, when you do that, you just don't experience the culture and all the... You're, you're seeing the same people all the time. And yeah. for me, I want to see other people. I don't want to see Americans. Period. <laughs> I want to go see where I came to visit. That's true. If I wanted to be comfortable, I'd stay at home. I mean, or I go visit and I come back to my really nice hotel. Well, how do you determine? Like, I think there's a certain amount of comfort that you definitely want. You don't want to be uncomfortable. Like, that's what I think about Vietnam. I was uncomfortable the entire time. And it wasn't until years later that I could appreciate the experience. But you had the experience. I mean, I don't really go places that make me uncomfortable. But I'm just saying, like, (laughs) you you had the experience. That's true. Well, true. Yeah. So ultimately... If, when you're traveling as a black female, as an American, you feel like it's usually just generally a positive experience, though? I think it can be with the right outlook. If you are scared or worried, mm-hmm. then, of course, you're not going to have a good trip. That's you have true. to understand that you are now an adventurer and you are in another country that is not America without our standards. And you just have to soak up what you're enjoying. So I just kind of feel like you need to, like... Leave out and, and experience it that way. And if you do that, you'll have an amazing time most times. Mm, there's that. Like energy attracts like energy. That is the truth. Well, bring your good energy when you when you travel. Apparently that's the most important thing to have. Bring it. Well, that's all we have for today. Bye.